Hello and welcome to Stage Front Salon. Next is Changelog Stream Processing with Apache Flink. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, also thank you uh, for having me back at Flink uh, at, at Berlin Buzzwords and presenting Apache Flink today. Um, yeah, so this talk is about changelog stream processing with Apache Flink, but as always, I will also have some introduction slides available so that you also, like also for Flink beginners, there is new content uh, to share. So first of all, uh, who am I? So my name is Timo Walter. Um, I am a long-term committer in the Apache Flink project, actually even before it became part of the Apache Software Foundation in 2014. Uh, I'm a member of the project committee there. Um, I'm also one of the top five contributors uh, in the meantime, based, uh, based on commits and additions. Um, I'm one of the core architects uh, around Flink SQL. And career-wise, I was one of the early software engineers at Data Artisans, part of the SDK team there. Data Artisans got acquired by Alibaba. Then I was the SQL team lead at Viverica back th then. And yeah, today I'm working on something completely new but still around Flink at a stealth startup. So first of all, uh, what is Apache Flink? Um, I can actually start with first explaining what is actually stream processing. So what are the building, the core building blocks for performing stream processing in general? Um, I split these building blocks into four categories. First, we need streams. We need time, state, and snapshots. So what does streams mean? Of course, we want to have a pipeline, so we need uh, streaming pipelines. Uh, we might want to distribute streams, not only to the cluster, like scale out, but we also maybe want to like uh, split the stream into like side channels and so on. We want to join streams together. We maybe have a main stream and a side stream, so we want to maybe enrich the main stream with some side input data. Um, we might have a control stream that like controls the state of our application. And of course, we also want to replay the stream and do fast, uh, fast processing um, of historical data. Um, then time is a very important concept in stream processing. Um, we might need to synchronize or wait a little bit for data, uh, but still we want to make progress as quickly as possible. Sometimes we want a timeout if a matching record is not is not arriving. Um, sometimes we want to do like fast forwarding. So we, uh, when we do like window processing, we don't want to wait an entire uh, hour to reprocess historical data. So an hour should be a rather a logical time that we can also like like fast forward um, um, during reprocessing. And of course, we also want to re play time. And especially state is, uh, is a key dis dis distinguishing factor. Um, we want to store maybe some machine learning model. We want to buffer records and wait for the other matching records. We want to cache records and avoid lookups to uh, external systems. Um, we want to like grow state, maybe also in the orders of terabyte. And of course, we want to expire and throw away state at some point. And if there is state involved, you have to uh, deal with fault tolerance. So we want to create backups, backups of our entire streaming application, different versions, um, we may, might want to fork our streaming application in a de deployment uh, development cluster. Um, we want to do A-B testing in different cluster environments. We want to time travel from different uh, stage snapshots. And of course, we want to restore in case of failures. So like these four categories are all um, basically met by Apache Flink. Um, but what makes Flink unique is also like its its simplicity, how all of that works. So you, usually you can really imagine it as if you would write a pipeline on a whiteboard. So you have some some um, like operators, like some sources, maybe a normalized step here, a filter there, a join there, and a sync at the end. Um, once you have declared that, Apache Flink does the rest under the, the under the hood. So of course you want to have this application scalable. Flink takes care of this. So in this case, maybe we want to scale to like a parallelism of two. Um, we have some operators that contain state. As I said before, Flink has the ability of like putting the state right next to the operator so that you have fast local state access that can also scale out and scale in together with the operator. Um, then, of course, there are events um, uh, streaming through the 
through the pipeline. You don't have to deal with threading or network connections and so on. Flink takes care of that. And um, Flink can also perform an entire snapshot um, of the pipeline to a durable um, storage. So all in all, it's a very flexible uh, fra frame framework. Uh, it is used for analytics, for data integration, for event-driven applications, ETL applications. Um, and as you can see, like as input, we so you can process transaction logs, IoT information, user interactions, uh, events of any kind. Also, the, the, the involved systems or the ecosystem around Flink is very di diverse. So we have messaging systems systems like Kafka or Pulsar, uh, regular files on S3, for example, databases, key value stores can be read, and on the other side, it's exactly the same. You can write to Kafka, you can write to Elasticsearch, or you define your custom application and send out an email as an event or something like that. Um, another frequently asked question is who is using Flink? Um, this slide is a bit overloaded, but it also shows uh, the diversity of the community. So we have a, a Flink a Slack channel, and there is an introduction uh, channel where companies can also like brag a little bit or like introduce themselves what they are using Flink for. So yeah, we have cloud data infrastructure at Apple. We have a feature platform at Square, uh, security products at Microsoft, uh, feature generation system at ByteDance. Um, yeah, we have gaming companies, we have little startups, um, yeah, various, various use cases, as you can see. So um, let's also talk about the APIs um, of Apache Flink, because how can you actually use Flink as a developer? Um, so this shows you a rough overview over the API stack. Um, at the bottom, you can see there is our uh, data flow runtime. On top of the data flow runtime, there is a low-level stream oper operator API. For example, Ap Apache Beam goes against this low-level stream oper operator API. But the native APIs of Flink, you can see on the top. So the data stream API is still the power horse um, um, of, the, of the framework of the platform. Um, then there is the table and SQL API, which we will talk in detail today. Um, th this has the specialty that there is an optimizer and planner under the hood, so less low-level access. And um, then on the right side, we have stateful functions, which gives you some kind of serverless stateful functions where you can design applications similar to an actor, actor model in a distributed way. So let me also quickly describe um, the data stream API. Here you can see like a very uh, simple uh, yeah, example, hello world example almost. Um, yeah, we are just in, uh, initializing our environment. We set the runtime mode to streaming. Um, we create a random stream from some one to three elements. And we are just executing this simple stream and printing the result to the client locally. Um, the properties of this API are that the data stream API exposes the building blocks for stream processing. So you have access to timer services. Um, you can build custom operators, custom uh, topologies. Um, all the business logic is written in so-called user-defined functions. So you can bring whatever library you want to bring. You can also use arbitrary user-defined records between the operators. So it might be just integer in this case, but it can also be an Avro approach protobuf um, record. Uh, the important property talking about like change logs in this context is that um, the data stream API conceptually is always an insert only or um, append only log. So the data stream API doesn't know about updates or deletions and so on. And as you can see, when we are just printing this example, the output will be one, two, three. Very simple. So now let's look at the table and SQL API. So this is again a little example. Um, we are initializing our environment. Um, you have two options. Either you use the programmatic API, the first one, to create your tables, or you use the second one, which is just uh, SQL as you know it, standard SQL. Um, again, we are executing and printing this locally. The important property of the table API is that it abstracts the building blocks for stream processing. So you don't see state or time or anything like that. The planner de 
de decides how the topo topology will look like, or if a filter is uh, logically makes more sense to have it at the beginning of the pipeline. So yeah, the planner tries its best um, to optimize the entire pipeline. Um, also, the business logic is declarative, um, similar to relational algebra. Um, record types are internally to the data uh, data engine, um, and there is also like a concept of rows uh, is exposed if you want to access um, the pipeline programmatically. And the interesting property he here is that conceptually um, we are working or dealing with tables, but under the hood um, the engine actually works um, with change logs. And this I want to uh, now show you in details. Um, and for that, let's also print or like execute and print this example. And you will see that the output in this case has like a special column at the beginning when you print it uh, to the console and an operation column. And this already shows you um, that we have some kind of insertion and deletions uh, going on uh, under the hood. So uh, let's get started with the changelog stream processing topic. Uh, the funny thing is, when I when I created the slides, I like I, uh, I got a little bit philosophical um, because like when you think about change, what is change? Uh, how is change evolving and so on? Like I somehow had to add a cheesy comment uh, from some website. So I added um, the comment from John F. Uh, John F. Kennedy: "Change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future." So uh, let's get started. First of all, I want to start with stream processing. So how does the Apache Flink community uh, looks at stream processing? Because actually, when you think about it, data processing in general is always stream processing. Um, somewhere at a company, you start creating data. And um, yeah, the data comes continuously in. And if the data doesn't, does not come continuously into the company, Either the use case has ended or the company uh, has gone bankrupt. So when you do um, batch processing at a company, what you're actually doing is you're creating, uh, you're cutting the stream into pieces. And these pieces are called bounded streams um, in Apache Flink. So we only dif uh, distinguish between bounded and uh, unbounded uh, streams. And um, yeah, unbounded streams have the nice property that you can start in the past and process present till future, or you can start in the now and process um, the future. And then batch processing is just like a special case uh, in the runtime based on bounded streams. But we are also we also support batch processing, just to mention it here. But we will focus on stream processing now. So when we talk about Flink SQL. How do, how do we work with streams in Flink SQL? And the answer for that is actually, you as a user, you don't work with streams. Users work with dynamic tables. So this is a concept. It is actually similar to a materialized view and databases. Um, there is no table stored somewhere in the state or so. Uh, it's really just a concept. And what I mean with this is, um, basically, as a user, you define your SQL query, like in this case, <clears throat> and, um, uh, some summing of transactions. On the left side, you declare the input table. On the right side, you declare the output table. All of that happens in SQL. And you will see that the result uh, is the same as if you would run it on a regular database. But in this case, um, yeah, we're running on it on a stream processor. So the question now is, is Flink a database? And the answer is clearly no, Flink is not a database because you can bring your own data and your own external systems. So you don't need to put your data into Flink. So let's, um, let's discuss a little bit what does it mean, okay, it's a table, but actually Flink is a stream processor. Uh, so how can we convert back and forth between streams and tables? tables. And this concept is also called a stream table duality, which means um, a stream is only just the change log of a dynamic table. So sources, operators, and sinks, they work on change logs under the hood. So Flink um, right now provides four different uh, types of changes. We have regular insertions. Um, this is, for example, the default when you do scanning or when you work on bounded results. Then you have uh, update befores, um, which basically retracts the previously emitted result. 
Um, then we have update after, which updates a previously emitted result. Um, and um, yeah, if there is a primary key, you can also get rid of the minus u. Um, and then we have a deletion if we just want to remove the last result, for example, in a database. Um, uh, each component, source, operator, sync, they always declare the kind of changes that they consume or produce. So if all, if the entire pipeline just uh, produces and consumes, processes, um, insertions, we can consider this as an append-only or insert-only pipeline. If it contains some minus u or minus d, we can consider this as an updating pipeline. Uh, if it does not contain a minus u, this is a retracting uh, pipeline. And if it never contains a minus u, but only plus u's, we are calling this an upserting pipeline. So here is a little uh, example um, how a stream table duality uh, looks in real life. So here you can see um, the change log and conceptually on the left and right side you can see the tables and on the right side especially you see um, if you would apply the change log to a key value store or a database how would the end result in the database for example would look like. So again um, we add some uh, record to Alice uh, 56 in this case, so the change log, of course, would also contain this insertion. This insertion is processed by Flink SQL. The output would then be um, the first sum. I mean, it's the first record, so it's still 56. And this ends up in the database. And then we continue. There's a Bob coming in. Again, it's also in the change log. Um, it's also the first Bob that we have. So we're also adding this um, to the table, to the output table. Yeah, and now there comes the second Alice. Um, and that means um, we have to change the output that we previously emitted. So first we have to remove the old record from the database. The 56 is gone. And then we are emitting um, the new result, which is 145, uh, and insert this uh, to the database. And as you can see, the end result is the same as if we would have done batch processing in a regular um, SQL engine. And if we want to do this a bit, little bit more efficient, we can also provide a primary key. Primary key means the downstream system now supports um, upserting. This means we can save 50% of the traffic uh, because we don't have to delete the row first. So we can we can now perform the, the, the update of this Alice uh, record uh, in place, basically. As you can see, nothing is deleted. We are, oh, oh, where was it here? So we are just doing uh, in place updates here. So, um, yeah, I already said that like sources, operators, and sinks, they all uh, define a change log mode. Um, and let's also look at concrete examples. So let's start at sources. Um, we have a ver variety of different sources. So we have file system, we can connect to Kafka, to JDBC. We can also like interpret Kafka not only as a log, but as an absurd log. So Kafka has the possibility if, a, if the value is null and we have enabled um, compaction um, topics compaction mode, then Kafka can also uh, like work as an absurd source. Um, yeah, or we store um, Divisium JSON records in Kafka. And for all these kind of sources, you have different changes coming in. So file system would just be insertion. A regular Kafka is also just insertion. Um, a Kafka connector with absurd, as you can see, would be insertion and deletion. Deletion in case the compaction has not started in the Kafka topic yet. Um, then we have JDBC. In this case, JDBC would mean we just perform an sc a scan of the entire table, and then we don't read this table, uh, not again. So just a single scan through the table. And then there is Debezium, JSON, for example, which would give you like all kinds um, of changes um, uh, into the runtime. And then the optimizer tracks um, how these change log modes propagate uh, through the entire topology, um, are there primary keys involved, and so on. And yeah, the sync later declares the changes that it can um, digest. 
So maybe one more mentioning or like um, explanation, what is the difference between uh, retract and upsert mode? Because people are sometimes a bit confused about these two modes. Uh, in general, the retract mode is the most flexible change log mode that we offer. Um, first of all, it doesn't need a primary key requirement. Uh, it works for almost uh, every system. So for example, a database without a primary key. Uh, it supports duplicate rows. Um, and in distributed systems, retraction mode is often unavoidable, uh, unavoidable. And for this, I also have brought a little example. Let's assume you know, we have a SQL query where we're counting uh, counts. So we are creating a histogram, basically. And this, for example, is quite tricky in a distributed system. So let's assume there is a record coming in. Or we are grouping um, by user and sending uh, and cal calculating uh, a count, then we are putting this count into state. So in this case, it would be count one. And then there is a second um, uh, event coming in. We are counting again. This time the count is two. But if there is a shuffling step afterwards, it would end up at different operators or different threads. So um, you have like a different um, threads, you have different um, records, so you still need a deletion to also update um, the other um, subtask in this case. So this is why retractions are usually the default mode within the engine. Um, but as I said before, like there is this um, absurd optimization, which saves you not only the traffic, but also the computation internal, uh, internally. And yeah, like to downstream systems, it also gives you in place uh, updates. And we can also take a look um, under the hood. So um, this is maybe for advanced people, but it, it might be useful to have, uh, have seen this before. Um, so this um, example here, we have a table transactions, so with transaction ID and amount. And we have a table payments with transaction ID uh, and the payment method that has been used. And yeah, we want to basically just join the payment with a transaction and output this, and then we want to just store it in the in the result table. And the result table in this case accepts all changes, whereas the input tables are just insertions. And um, this is a typical explain uh, explain the SQL query from the engine. So this is the the operator tree that is uh, that gets executed. So you, you see. Um, you see here, this is the source with an insertion mode, another source with an insertion mode, then you're performing uh, the join. The optimizer recognizes that both inputs are insertions, so the join will also just create insertions and uh, yeah, store this uh, in the sink. So let's assume, for example, we have a left outer join. Left outer join have the specialty that if there is no matching record on the other side, then it will emit a null first. And later this null might be retracted again and replaced with a proper value when the join is when the join is able to find a matching record on the other side. So as you can see here, the, the, the change log mode of the left uh, um, outer join changes, and now we have update before, update after, and deletions um, as output. So maybe now we want to do not only do like updating um, results, maybe what we want to even declare a primary key. Um, so for example, the result table defined a primary key, uh, on on um, the transaction ID. Um, but the interesting thing is now this has also changed the sync. So now the sync has gotten a special property. Why is that? The reason for that is um, there is we declared a primary key on the result, but there is no primary key definition on the sources. So in theory, there can be multiple transactions with the same transaction ID and multiple payments with the same transaction ID. So the planner tries its best to perform the so-called absurd materialize to like um, to um, met this primary key constraint. So there is like an operator before the database. To like to um, to make the make the records unique based on primary key, 
Um, but actually, it would be even better to properly declare your pipeline in this case. So in this case, all, all tables get a primary key on the transaction ID. And now you can also see that uh, in the explain, now the join operator notices, notices it that, oh, now we have two, primary, uh, two um, unique keys on both sides. And I can also adapt the change log mode accordingly. So the update before um, is gone now. Um, yeah, and this is a very efficient uh, pipeline. So um, in general, there is um, there is um, tra there are transitions going on under the hood. Um, um, as I said before, if the pipeline only contains insertions, this is an append-only stream or append-only table. This is highly, uh, usually highly state efficient, um, depending op on the operation, like for example a left outer join, the, the operation uh, becomes or the table becomes uh, updating. Um, if you have a couple of updating operations, it's still stays um, updating, um, but like the, the, the runtime also has means, for example, to um, like remove the optimization um, from updating um, to retracting um, it's for special cases. So like in the pipeline itself, you see special operators like change log normalize, which converts an updating stream to a retraction stream. And there is also the opposite um, operation uh, shortly before uh, sync, which is called upstart materialize, which creates a retracting table out of a, uh, an updating table out of a retracting table. But this is very low level, but it's 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 uh, sometimes quite useful to understand uh, how much power is in the engine under the hood that you usually don't see when you just declare your SQL and and your tables. So now I also want to um, show you uh, some little demo. Um, there is a lot of a lot of stuff to show. Uh, I also have like a big repository on my GitHub account called Flink API examples with a lot of different uh, use cases for Data Stream API, for Table API. Um, yeah, in this case, I want to keep it simple. So I, I have just a uh, MySQL database, the MySQL database is already running. I have filled the MySQL database um, with some records. So um, first of all, we have two tables, a customer table and a transaction table. The customer table has a, let's make it bigger, um, the customer table has an ID column and a name. And yeah, there are three customers already in there, an Alice, Bob, and Kyle. Um, and then we have a transaction table um, with some transaction ID, amount, and customer ID. And yeah, I also added some transactions already in there. Um, so I have um, created already these tables. Um, and now comes the interesting part. How do we actually like access the data in the database? Because you have two possibilities to access the data. Either, as I said before, you perform a full scan and that's it. So that would be uh, the JDBC connector, or you want to continuously fetch the results um, from the database. So you want to have like a monitoring uh, source based on the database, which opens the space to a so-called CDC, change data capture uh, processing. So um, in this example, um, I'm using the Flink CDC uh, project. Um, I also have a link on a later slide. And yeah, basically, this is how I declare it. So I say for connector MySQL CDC, and yeah, then I give it a schema and some configuration options. And yeah, that's it. Then I can actually already output uh, my data. So um, I run uh, execute SQL, select star from transaction CDC print. And as you can see now, it first of all, it will perform a scan of the entire table. It will print this uh, in some seconds, but then it will continuously wait for new incoming records. So as you can see, the prog program is still running and it waits, waits for input. So I have a second uh, program here. In theory, I could have used the MySQL client to add new rows to the database table, but I thought, why not just using Flink, a Flink batch job to add new rows to the database? So um, yeah, I can just run this Flink job that simply adds new rows to the Flink, uh, to the MySQL table. 
And yeah, the other running job will pick this up in a second, hopefully, if everything goes well. Otherwise, it's not my fault. No, there it is. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> um, as you can see, yeah, it's, it's continuously uh, monitoring. Let's have a different example now. Um, maybe let's um, join different um, tables together. So in this case, um, as I said before, the JDBC. Um, so first of all, here we want to join the customers and the transactions. Um, the specialty here is the transactions is CDC, so it's real time, it comes in continuously, but we declared the customers as a regular scan it once um, CDC uh, source. So again, we say connect for connector JDBC, we declare the schema here and some um, connection properties. And the specialty is there is a special kind of join uh, in Flink called uh, time versioned join. So what you can do is you can perf you can perform real-time lookups uh, to connectors. So for example, the JDPC connector supports this. So if you read this, um, read this SQL statement, like for every incoming uh, record for, for transactions, we are basically perform a lookup in the database um, as of now. So the current processing time, the current wall clock time, and we are searching for the matching uh, customer ID. So let's also run this. Oh, I have to, I have to stop the other one. So here. Takes a while, but it will start. So here you can see, again, um, we are waiting for new transactions. The existing transactions and the existing customers have been joined right at the beginning. And yeah, let's now um, add another record, for example, another transaction. So this should work. It just takes a while, exactly. So now we have we have um, joined the the transaction with Kyle. So what happens, for example, if Kyle decides to become a Kyle Lee? Um, so we are updating the customer data in the customer table. For now, nothing will change because all the previous joins have been already done. So there is no no join performed again. Um, but if we now, um, I hope this works. Um, yeah, if we now add a new transaction, it will look up the current value for Kyle and now Kylie um, in the database, and it will show you um, Kylie when performing the next uh, the next join. I hope this works. Yeah, here you can see it. Yeah, at uh, at this time it was still Kyle, but now it's Kylie, so it's uh, updated based on the current database value. And there's my, much more um, that you can do. Um, I would recommend, as I said, my, my GitHub repository. And if you like to, you can also go a level deeper. So if you, um, if you want to declare something in SQL and you notice, oh wait, SQL might not be the perfect fit for my use case because I have some special operator or I want to do some machine learning or something very special that you cannot express uh, with SQL, then you can also just bridge between or like go back and forth between data stream API and table API. So you just call uh, to change log stream um, of your table and then you're back uh, in the data stream world um, so you ha you're dealing with the data stream of row here. Row, rows in Flink always have a change log kind or row kind. So in this case, we're for, for example, we are filtering, filtering out deletions and yeah, you can have arbitrary pipelines and then you can also go back into the table world whenever, whenever you need it. So in summary, I would say Flink SQL Angel is a very powerful changelog processor, as you might have seen. 
Um, and it's also a very flexible tool for like integrating various systems from databases, key value stores, logs, whatever you want. Um, and you can also see this uh, in the ecosystem. So I said it already, like there is this uh, package, flinkpackages.org, which, which has this large amount of CDC connectors. It has already 2.6K GitHub stars. Here you can see which databases it integrates with. Um, then there is also something completely new on the block called the table storage or table store. Uh, it's, it's in an early version, early stage, but we're also starting like to have a unified storage engine for dynamic tables. So you can like store a change log uh, in this table store, but you can also use the table store to run uh, data warehouse or like analytical queries uh, using batch mode. So this is also quite interesting and maybe worth to look into it. Yeah, I think uh, that's it. And yeah, I'm happy to answer questions now. Thank you. Hello. So my question is around supporting uh, schema evolution. Mm -hmm. D does it already support? I saw some ticket, which seems like there's a lot of comments and work. But I don't know the degree of like support for the schema evolution. No, this is this is still on the to-do list. So for for table API, there is no schema evolution uh, right now. But for data stream API, as I said, you can have custom records, which means, for example, Afro and Afro has already a schema evolution. So for example, if you want to go back and forth between data stream API and table API, you could, for example, create the source in data stream API, prepare the records as you need it for the SQL pipeline, um, and then switch to SQL. So like you could have the, the, the schema evolution as a pre-processing step before the SQL query, for example. Any more questions? I saw that you use both the CDC and the JDBC one, uh, but in the case of the JDBC, when you had the update, on the customer table that was not immediately shown in Flink. So my question is, should we always do via CDC or is there a special use case for the JDBC one? Uh, I would say, yeah, it, 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 it's in most of the cases you want to do CDC, I would say. It was just like uh, like to show you what is the difference between a snapshot and between CDC. Um, so in, in, in practice, if you have a static data set lying in the database, this is like will be static forever, then JDBC makes sense. But usually, as I said before, everything is changing continuously, so it usually makes no sense to use the JDBC as a source unless it is with the syntax as system time off, where you perform uh, real-time lookups uh, to the database. So this, this still makes sense. Then it still makes sense to use the JDBC connection. OK, thank you. There is also a question online. I can show you the last word, which has no vo uh, zero volts. Okay, so the question is, what are the practical limitations uh, for the Flink table API? How many tables can be uh, involved in joins? Number of records uh, per table. So uh, th these questions are always difficult to answer because it really depends on the use case. In general, what I know is that the table API is used at like like very large scale, scale, scale companies like Alibaba that run SQL programs on thousands and thousands of nodes. Um, you can configure how long, for example, you want to keep records in state, so that might improve um, the like like how many joints of tables you can uh, perform. Um, in general, as I said before, it's never the entire table that is stored in state. It's only it, we only store in state what is necessary to compute. Uh, this particular uh, operation. So if you use all the optimizations that we can offer, uh, also related to event time, which I did not mention uh, in this talk, then the state size can be very, very efficiently managed and um, yeah, it doesn't grow like infinitely. And in this case, you can also join a lot of, a lot of tables, but I cannot give you uh, concrete numbers here. Any more questions? Okay, then thank you very much.
Thank you.